This video was brought to you by Nebula. Over the past few weeks, European farmers have really stolen the spotlight. And that's because a wave of farmers' protests have swept across the Netherlands, Germany, France, Belgium, Poland, and Hungary, forcing the EU to announce last week that it would scrap a regulation from its 2040 agricultural emissions target and ditch a plan to cut its pesticide use in half. Apparently inspired by their peers' success, in the past few days protests have spread to Spain, Italy, Greece and Portugal too. So in this video we'll take a look at the latest protests, the emerging urban-rural divide in European politics, and what might happen next. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Let's start by taking a look at the news from Spain, Italy and Greece. Last week in Spain, the situation escalated when three farmers associations joined protests blocking roads in eight autonomous communities. In just the first three days, the Spanish police filed administrative sanctions for over 5,000 people, including at least 799 violations of Spain's controversial citizen security law, also known as the gag law, and arrested at least 19 people. Regardless, 2,000 tractors brought Barcelona to a standstill, while in the city of Ciudad Real, farmers poured 25,000 litres of French wine into the street in front of the local water authority to protest against water restrictions. Meanwhile, in Italy, 1,600 tractors assembled on the outskirts of Rome last Friday, preparing to arrive in the capital by Monday. Farmers in Milan even brought a cow to a march with them through the streets, and Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney has already U-turned on an income tax exemption for farmers that was due to expire this year. Meanwhile, in Greece, farmers are continuing to set up roadblocks in Macedonia and Thessaly, where the cities of Larissa and Kardidza have seen protesters dump hay bales and milk on the streets. While the main Athens-Thessaliki highway was blocked ahead of a meeting between Greek farmers and the Prime Minister in Athens on Tuesday, and last weekend representatives from the Central and West Macedonia regions reportedly met to consider blockading Greece's borders with Albania, Bulgaria and North Macedonia. Now, perhaps inspired by the political success of the farmers' citizen movement in the Netherlands, many right-wing politicians have expressed their support for these farmers. Maloney has repeatedly stressed that her government has already diverted 3 billion euros from the EU's post-pandemic recovery fund to the agricultural sector. And the controversial leader of Spain's Vox party has called farmers victims of the policies of Sanchez, Macron, the European Commission, and also the European People's Party. So what's motivating these farmers' protests in southern Europe? Well, as we see it, there are at least four reasons. The EU's climate policies, cost of living concerns, competition from foreign imports, and the emerging urban-rural divide. Firstly, the EU's new climate policies. Now, the EU reformed its common agricultural policy as part of the European Green Deal in July 2023, introducing stricter regulations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by pushing farmers towards more sustainable but costlier practices. For context, while farming makes up just 1.4% of the EU's GDP and 4.2% of employment, it accounts for over 14% of its greenhouse gas emissions. In Spain, for instance, farmers are protesting plans to reduce the amount of water used from the Targus River to irrigate farmland in the southeast, which Mercia's regional leader said could threaten 25,000 jobs. Other farmers have also complained that these new regulations are unduly bureaucratic, creating an unreasonable amount of paperwork. Now, on to our second reason, the cost of living concerns. High energy prices after Russia's invasion of Ukraine hit Europe's farmers particularly hard, given the large amount of energy required for agricultural processes and natural gases' role in the production of fertilizers. While agricultural input costs have come down since, farmers in southern Europe have been hit with a series of extreme weather events, which have been ironically and depressingly made more likely by climate change. Spanish farmers, for instance, are currently struggling with a record-breaking drought, with some water reservoirs at less than 15% capacity. And early this month, Catalonia described itself as in a state of emergency. This has made irrigation, which accounts for about 14% of water use within the OECD countries, more difficult and more costly. 
Similarly, in Greece last year, wildfires wiped out about 20% of annual farm revenue. And in northeastern Italy, which is home to Europe's most agriculturally productive areas, it's at risk of becoming an arid zone due to the increasingly frequent droughts and extreme high temperatures. In fact, data from Kaisha Bank suggests that climate change is already leading to lower yields and weaker sector growth in southern Europe. To make matters worse, EU analysis suggests that the Mediterranean's agricultural sector will become more adversely affected by climate change than other parts of Europe in the future. On to our third reason, competition for foreign imports. In Eastern Europe, farmers have been protesting over the impact of cheap Ukrainian imports, and now farmers in Spain are taking issue with cheap imports from Morocco too. Tomatoes have become the latest target in a long-standing dispute between the two countries, with one Spanish newspaper even asking, does the European Union want to depend on Mohammed VI when making its salads? Cheap Moroccan produce has caused the price of tomatoes to drop 40% in Spain over the last year, and some Spanish farmers have recently dumped boxes of Moroccan cherry tomatoes out of the back of a truck in fury. On to our fourth and final reason, the emerging urban-rural divide. Essentially, these protests are partly a symptom of a general feeling in Europe's rural communities that they're being in some sense ignored by their governments, which in turn is creating a new urban-rural divide in European politics. To be fair here, there is a growing economic disparity in EU countries between the rural and urban areas. Between 2012 and 2021, the urban-rural gap in incomes increased by almost 20%, and employment rates have been consistently higher in urban areas. Polling suggests that people in rural areas also feel more neglected by their national governments and are less likely to trust the EU, with the gap widening significantly since just 2020. This divide is also reflected in voting patterns, with rural voters more likely to vote for Eurosceptic, socially conservative and migration skeptic parties. So with that all considered, what happens next? Well, the farmers have already won some pretty significant concessions from both the EU and their national governments, including, perhaps most notably, the effective suspension of the long-awaited EU-Mercosur trade deal. Unfortunately for the EU and European governments, this has apparently only encouraged other farmers, and protests now look set to continue through at least late February. Going forward, this is going to make both the EU and national governments far more wary of introducing not just any legislation that affects farmers, but also any climate legislation with politically uncomfortable distribution effects. In other words, it's probably going to make European policymakers far more cautious about the green transition. And while this might sound like unequivocally bad news for anyone who thinks that Europe should be doing more towards net zero, in a sense though, this is a conversation that Europe needs to have. The politics of the green transition have been relatively uncontentious so far, because A, we did the easy stuff first, and B, setting targets and deadlines for future governments is a lot easier than actually meeting them. Now these deadlines are approaching and net zero becomes more expensive, Europe has to decide both how fast it wants to make the green transition and who should pay for it. As a TLDR viewer, I can pretty confidently say that you're curious about the world around you, keen to know what's really going on rather than just the general media narrative. And one country where this is particularly interesting is China, where a lot of media coverage can be muddled or misleading. If you want to dive deeper though, I'd recommend Polymatter's incredible series, China Actually, which explores the truth behind the Chinese news, examining the truth about China's one-child policy, why China has no allies, how Chinese censorship really works, and what exactly China's nuclear policy looks like. All in all, it's a brilliantly researched and thoughtful series, and it's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. As you know, Nebula is the service that we built with a whole bunch of our creator friends and is home to tons of smart, educational content from all of your favorite creators. The best part is by signing up, you not only get exclusive series like China Actually, Modern Conflicts from Real Life Law, or The Logistics of X from Wendover Productions, it also includes all of our content totally ad-free and sometimes before it arrives on YouTube. Plus, signing up directly supports TLDR, because by doing so, you contribute to the budgets of these big budget documentaries and help us to grow and expand our ambitions. So if you want to get more superb content and support TLDR, then if you sign up using the link below, you can support us directly and get Nebula for 40% off an annual plan. 
That's about £2 a month. Thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.